Thanks for listening to CarCast on Podcast One. Hey, it's Shaq, and with the NBA Finals in full gear, you know we're all over it on the big podcast for Shaq. Can the King bring another title to the land, or will Steph and KD make history again? We got a cover like no one else, plus the biggest guests from sports and entertainment, tons of laughs, and the top stories every week, all summer long. Just go ahead and crown those champs. The big podcast with Shaq, with a new episode every Monday at Podcast One. Get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get on mandate. Get it on. Welcome to CarCast. I'm Adam Pearl. That's the, the moderator. Hi. Matt DeAndre over there. What's going on, man? Oh, trying not to sneeze. You got a <laughs> seasonal allergies? Nah, just, I don't know what happened. Just a little bit of a chest congestion. Maybe mm-hmm. you can hear it. But yeah. It's good. It's going around. I mean, never stops here, but it's going around. <laughs> Matt Sick, uh, the porcelain punisher over there. He likes oh, so to toggle, I got it here. <laughs> he likes to toggle between actual illness and then seasonal allergies. That's his, <laughs> that's his thing. But uh, so uh, here we are. Uh, the car, we got a car for sale. Yeah. It's on Bring a Trailer. Uh, it's a Z car, 280ZX. It's the Fitzy car. Um, it's a cool piece. It really. Uh, so it, many great stories about this car. Your stories and its history. Yeah. Um, Jim. Fitzgerald is uh, the winningest SCCA driver on the planet, right? Over 350 career wins. All done in this one car. <laughs> <laughs> so the car's got a lot of miles? It's got a lot of history. No, he, he drove. He was uh, Newman's teammate. He was, uh, I guess, an instructor up at Road Atlanta. Um, he did everything. As a matter of fact, I don't... Uh, I don't know if you recall this, but um, or if you heard this, but we were uh, hanging out at Maria Menounos' house uh, last night, and uh, we we're talking to uh, Sly Stallone. Yeah, I was talking about driven. What a fascinating guy, by the way. It was interesting. We Such ta- a great conversation. We talked for a long time, but uh, there was a guy who was a pro wrestler, and he was sitting next to me. And at some point, he just yeah. said, "I was at St. Petersburg where that guy died in '87." And oh, I said, that, really? was, that was Jim Fitzgerald. That was Newman's partner. And uh, he was like, yeah, I was living there. And I remember the race. And I was just a weird, I, I, I've never, you know, I made the movie. I talked to everybody. I've yeah. never, he just randomly, he wasn't even, I don't think, he wasn't even, we weren't talking about Jim Fitzgerald. He just said, yeah. I was at a, a, a race in St. Petersburg in 87 when a guy died. Which is also weird because uh, that guy is Sean Waltman. He's an X-Pac. He's a WWE wrestler, former wrestler. I didn't even know he was a car guy. <laughs> he's always been here, and he's looked at the cars, and, and right. but he never really like brought it up. He's like, hey, I, was, you know, I went to races as a kid. I, I guess. <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't know if he was a kid. I mean, I don't know. If he's not young. He's not old. But 87... To you as a kid, to me, you know, I was just living in an apartment with a bunch of dudes in North Hollywood. Yeah. Like I was, uh, I was young, but I wasn't, I wasn't wow, in high school. He was there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, that driver and his personal car, uh, not his personal grocery getter, but his personal race car uh, later on is uh, the car that's for sale, and it's for sale. Not because uh, we don't love it, but it's for sale because there's so many projects. There's so many other cars. There's so many. Uh, there's only so much room, believe yeah. it or not. And we're just trying to uh, thin the herd. We, But it's always with an eye on uh, other vehicles. Yeah. Usually more expensive. Yeah. So the ones. Fitzy car is the 280ZX. It's a naturally aspirated mm-hmm. uh, straight six. It's got the big flares on it and the big rims on it. It looks cool. It's a good looking car, yeah. You've raced it. Yep. At Laguna Seca, at Sonoma. Yeah. Few times at Laguna Seca. Our epic story of Les and leaving the uh the tire gauge on the back of the car. Yeah, that's the car. That's the car. <laughs> yeah. History. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Own a piece of Les's history. I'm not sure whose history. But this car ran the runoffs in 80, 81, and 82. Or was it 81, 82, 83? It ran like three years of the run. I think it was 80, 81, and 82. Right. And, and it's, uh, um, 
it's called the designated hitter because um, as a legend has it, it was there to take out Freddie Baker and his fast jag. Yeah, it so was on the pole or on the inside or outside of on the you know in number two slot, but on the pole on, it, on the front. It, it was race weekend, and the night before the race, there was a like a driver's dinner, mm-hmm. and as a joke, somebody gave uh, Fitzgerald his name tag, but his name tag said "designated hitter" on it. Right, and then the next day, like lap one, he. He crashed into uh, Freddie Baker's Jaguar. Well, the, it was sort of that. And they're like, was that intentional? Was well, it not the, intentional? <laughs> and again, it's these things get lost over time. It less, less swears by it. But the, the deal was this guy, Freddie Baker, and this Jag was going to whoop up on everybody. Yeah. And the... There was a rivalry. It's been going on for a while. Like they, Well, I think the story was is... is Dotson had been winning yeah. in the in the past, and their winning streak was going to come to an end because of this guy Freddie Baker in his Jag, unless which is like a six year old Jag, right? That, unless somebody could take him out, in which case the Dotson winning streak yeah. could continue. Now, uh, I think he did hit him. Yes, they did continue the race. Yes, and Fitzy got black flagged at some point. Yeah, that's he what, did. That's what we know. And did I, Baker I don't remember go if Fitzy, on to win the race? He did. And I don't remember if if Fitzy was black flagged during the race or after they were like, you're disqualified. Right. All right. So that is the car. And uh, and then obviously the car turned into this legend. It has the they printed designated hitter stickers. And they put it on the car. And, right. and if you buy the car, you come with a sheet of these stickers that have never been used. You can... Put right. them on your lunchbox. So, your trapper uh, keeper. Yeah, and uh, yeah. <laughs> you may uh, go to uh, go to trailer. Bring a trailer. Bring a trailer. Sorry, go to bring a trailer. Think, I'm thinking about Dennis Prager. <laughs> <laughs> go to nosafespaces dot com. Go to bring a trailer and, and uh, uh, check it out. Yeah, the auction ends on Tuesday. So as you're listening to this, you have a few days: the weekend and a couple days. So right, you can jump on there. All right, uh, you were driving your uh, Ford F fifty with the ten speed in it. The F-150 with a 10-speed transmission and an EcoBoost motor. Yeah. And I'm not a truck guy by any means, but what an impressive <laughs> truck. What do you think that does for gas mileage? Well, the way I've been driving it, probably not much. <laughs> but it, it, it theoretically, you get the, you get the twin-turbo yeah. EcoBoost V6. You get the 10-speed transmission automatic versus... Let's say in the past, uh, a small block, you know, V8, 302 or 289 or whatever size they've gotten yeah. into, and then like a five-speed automatic, you must be getting 10, 15% better mileage. And, 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 it, and it shifts a lot more. Like, it, it puts a lot more effort into finding the right gears. And it does skip shift. Like, on acceleration and deceleration, it'll go one to three to, you know, to... to right. You know, it's it's an interesting thing, which is I, I never really thought about the transmission. I, I've been thinking, I always thought about the engine and the most efficient engine, the most horsepower yeah. and the most torque. And then how do we take the smaller engines? Well, we put a turbo on it, but we don't just put one turbo because that's going to create the lag. We want the two turbos or the four turbos to create the blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But if you really think about it, as you get that engine with that turbo especially turbo. Now, look, when you're running just a big block diesel, who cares? Because you're just always in the torque band. Right. You're always right in the sweet spot. You just mash your foot, and that's it. You have, you know, 650 square inches of of torque or foot-pounds of torque at 1,800 RPM or something. So who cares? But if you're running a smaller displacement, like, what is it, 3.5? Yes, 3.5. So you got a 3.5, which is... Certainly by American standards, a very small displacement engine, and you're pulling a pretty big truck, and the truck could be pulling a trailer. Yeah. So how do you map that engine? Well, now let's go to the transmission, because the transmission is really going to keep that thing in its power band. And the thing about that engine, I mean, if you want to take it to an extreme, you know, the V6 engines with the turbos on them in the 
Newman race cars can either have no no horsepower or shitload of horsepower, oh, yeah. just depending on where you're at in the in the re- in, in the RPMs in the band. Yeah, you know. So the transmission is really kind of interesting in that it's it's very important to keeping that small displacement engine working because the the thing about that engine is. Obviously, you can't just sort of throw cubic inches at at problems anymore. You need the dis- you need it in its ban, yeah, like constantly. And the thing about the small displacement is they're only working when they're in that ban, that that zone. Th- this tr- transmission is complex. It's actually a joint venture between GM and Ford. Mm-hmm. And so we have this ten speed transmission, one version in an F one fifty, and then another version in like the new ZL one Camaro. Yeah, saw you know, one the other day, and uh, and obviously because they're so electronic, you know, they're just so controlled by computers and stuff. Now, I don't think it physically has ten gears in it. I think it simulates gears by having probably like an actual six sets of gears. And oh, then, interesting. And then simulate other type of gears by combining different cogs. Yeah. Basically, you know, I couldn't say for sure exactly how many are in there, but when, but it, it creates this ten speed transmission, and it's very smooth. It's it's. It's very seamless because there's less of a dramatic change in the engine speed when you're right. switching. Right. You know, when you're going from one to two to three to four on your four speed, you've got to get a lot of RPM before it could switch, and then it really bogs down. This thing shifts all the time, and you don't even notice it. You know, I I reset the uh, the computer mm-hmm. when I when they delivered the truck like five days ago, and I I did take a trip to San Diego and back to pick up a car and bring it. So. I've been averaging 16 miles per gallon total, but that includes a trip to San Diego and back with a car. Towing. Towing. Uh, I think it's probably like getting 17 normal and maybe 15 with the trailer. The um, other – now, it kind of begs the question about the the diff in the rear end. Like, makes me think, I wonder when we're going to start moving gears around and doing some variable stuff with those. As well. Yeah. Now that seems a little more locked in stone, but on the other hand, these guys are going to town and they're realizing that gearing is a big is a big deal when it comes to performance and, and yeah. economy and all that stuff. And I'm just wondering I have no idea what's going on in the rear end, but I bet the rear end may be next. Yeah, well this has the tow package on it, so I'm pretty sure one of the gauges I see I was looking at it, it was like I see uh, oil pressure. And I see temp, and I see another temp gauge, but with the gear around it, and I realize that's gear temp. Right. Or rear or, gear temp. I assume diff. so. I mean, I guess it could be transmission temp, but... Mm, yeah, could be. All right. Uh, let's see. Questions? It's probably transmission temp. Your questions? Your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, we talked to Stallone about uh, Driven, his uh, F1 or turned into indie movie. Yeah. He wasn't happy about it. But, he wasn't happy with how it ended result, but man, the pitch of the movie that he gave us yeah. of what he wanted it to be yeah. is such a good movie. <laughs> yeah, more more <laughs> F1. Uh, but don't worry. there was uh, I limited the Cobra talk to 25 minutes. We'll put a cap on uh, our, Cobra, our Cobra talk. It was like a two and a half hour conversation. <laughs> Was did, a lot he, of, did he give you an insight into the sequel? Because I remember he tweeted that he had picture. so much insight about this movie, his ideas for the movie, his life during this movie, and yes, he had ideas about a, yeah, a, 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 a sequel or a reboot. I'm not sure, but yeah, he definitely he definitely had thoughts and uh, like serious thoughts. Serious thoughts. <laughs> I don't I don't remember. Like uh, first off, I don't know how much of this information he wants out there, but I do remember. When I brought up Cobra to him, which was uh, immediately, he was explaining <laughs> that he did he, – this is something that he's going to be revisiting. Yeah. When you say immediately, it was like, hey, can we talk about Cobra? My name is Adam. <laughs> 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 yeah. He, he jumped right in, though. So uh, Yeah. I said, hello, my name is Adam uh, Cabrola. <laughs> 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 How do you like that, Cabretti? Yeah. I'm going with Cabrola. Yeah, yeah, he had a lot to say. I, I think uh, I think there's a very good chance you'll have him come on to ACS one day. 
Yeah, one day soon. All right, I uh, want to tell you about uh, Lone, back for its fourth season with a crazy new twist. Yeah, rules have changed, man. Ten survivalists are still dropped in an unforgiving wilderness, wilderness but uh, now they got uh, five competing teams, brothers, fathers, sons, a married couple, and it's a different kind of survival show. Besides their uh, teammates, they're truly alone. So that's it. It's not the cameraman. It's not standing there. You know when they're talking about, oh, I need water. And you realize there's a guy standing there eating a granola bar holding the camera. That ain't, <laughs> that ain't this. They give them the cameras. They film themselves. So uh, they're truly alone. There are no, um, no gimmicks, no forced challenges. The teams are split, and uh, they have five items each uh, to win. They must survive North Vancouver Island. It is uh, $500,000 at stake, by the way. This is uh, not chump change. New season premieres Thursday. That's coming up this Thursday, right? Where are we? Yeah, this Thursday. Uh, and uh, 10 o'clock, 9 central on History, man. History. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Uh, let's see. What else? Uh, you got questions there, Max Pat? Sure do. And if you guys want to write in, uh, just go to carcassshow.com. And uh, you can leave a, a little letter for Adam and Matt to answer. Also, um, we have some uh, What Can't Adam Complain About submissions on our Facebook, too. So we'll get into that in a sec. But uh, Kenneth, he's writing in from Tennessee. He has a question about vintage stock cars. Um, get it on. Love the show. Love Matt. Thanks for keeping it going. I, I know you weren't into NASCAR, nor am I, but um, you can get some used stock cars cheap around here, especially in North Carolina. Bring a trailer just had one that was going for less than 10k i've heard uh about guys in my youth buy and sell cars that were in races for less than 10k do you think there will ever be a market for them i understand that a dale earnhardt daytona car would be valuable but do you think a car driven by non-legend would ever bring bring in some bucks stock cars for 10k like 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 full stock or like the lower level you know like i went to irwindale and did a few laps around the oval and arguably a stock car but right that is not what but you know, I, Dale Earnhardt I, Jr. Runs. I have we have kept a, a very close eye on the vintage race car market and the way the vintage race car market works. It's sort of like how the housing market works, which is, well, all the mansions in Beverly Hills and Bel Air go for, you know, millions of dollars. And then people start rumbling. They start go over the hill. What's in Studio City? You know. Then those start going up in price, and yeah. then they move a little more deeper. Well, what's in North Hollywood, you know? And before, in, at, a, at some point, you realize the little dinky joints in North Hollywood are selling for what the stuff in Beverly Hills sold for 15, 20 years earlier, you know? And you're yeah. like, God damn, I could have had that thing in Bel Air for the same price of the shitbox. And so, you know, it's the same with everything. It's the same with vintage race cars, it, you know? When we got started, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was pretty much, well, it's got to be Ferrari or it's got to be Porsche. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we're, we've got no, we got no real room for Japanese stuff. We got no real room. There's a couple of English, some English stuff we'll take like Jaguar, but not, not, not others, you know. And there wasn't this place, like, like if you had a Lancia, um, Evo, whatever, uh, rally car, like there's no market for, Lancia, you know, yeah. or, or rally cars. There was no market for Japanese cars. There wasn't any market for anything. It had to be German or Italian, and it had to be, you know, 50s, 60s. They, they, certainly nothing in the 80s. They weren't going to, that right. wasn't vintage. We needed vintage, you know. Well, now we're living in a world where cars in the 80s that are Japanese are selling for 250 grand. You know, there's stuff out there depending on the history yeah. and everything. So whatever this was, it, it doesn't continue to be this. Nothing does now that the Ferraris and the German cars are still moving up. They're yeah. still and they'll way always up. do well. I mean, overall that'll go up and down, up and down, but, it, but the overall trajectory is going up. Right. And so now you're looking at, uh, a Japanese car for two fifty when you when ten years ago you were looking at that Porsche for two fifty or even that Ferrari for two fifty like the house in yeah. Bel Air now you're living in the place in North Hollywood and that's just the way the market goes so in terms of and and the last 
of these cars to be touched has been NASCAR. And I don't mean the last, but what I mean is, is all the road racing stuff and even the rally stuff has been, you know, snapped up. There's, there's yeah. a market now. And even the vintage dragsters and funny cars and stuff, have, have, those had no market, right, yeah. a few years ago. Now, those with the crackle fests and everything, those are all going up, right? Uh, I don't know that those have gone up as fast, but they're, they've gone up as well. So the, the NASCAR is kind of the last group. Yeah, it's been weird because I've seen them pop up at auctions, but they're usually like the charity cars, like the race team or somebody or like a Chip Ganassi would donate a car and, yeah. be a, and it would pull good money, I but, saw, but mostly to raise something for, you know, I saw for like a 68 Bobby Allison, you know, Galaxy or something, and they wanted 200 for it, like that car, those cars yeah. were, there's no such thing as 200 for that car 10 years ago. That was oh, yeah, yeah. 30 grand. Well, the one thing we've definitely noticed is, is right now the market is bad. I think overall the market is low for collector cars. We watch a lot of the auctions, all the auctions, let's face it, all the auctions, and the market is pretty low, but the race cars and the vintage race cars seem to be a little bit less affected by, by the down market. And I think it's because... I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think it's less affected. I think they're marching on. They've just been moving forward. I, I, I don't. I feel like the other ones have dipped, and they haven't dipped less. They've just been moving on. Right. But they were because they were undervalued in the first place. Yeah. Maybe maybe they were in a bad market, or maybe they just never were really appreciated at the time. But you know, I think. Uh, so many of these race cars are one of one or one of two or one of three, and that makes them special. And the ones with more race history uh, makes it special. And, you know, you and I were just talking the other night about, uh, you know, there's a – you start attaching Le Mans or Daytona or something like that, any of that race history to a car, and it immediately adds a significant bump in value to that car. Right. So, I mean, I think – I don't know about the ten thousand dollars stock car that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, if that's going to go up in value, but you're starting off at a pretty inexpensive car, so I, I guess there's potential for it to go up. But certainly the ones with significant race history, they're not inexpensive, but I would they're much, definitely collectible. And I would I would say this: I think you're much better off finding a car with some history, as much history as you can afford. That is a basket case versus something that's turnkey that has little to no history. Yeah. Even if you got to spend X amount to put it back together over the next five years or whatever it is, go for all the history you can get, even if the guy's bringing the thing over in crates. And then you put it back to how it was. That car will be worth far more. Yeah. And and I, I I think the race cars will do better in the long run. And I think I, this is a tough one, but I would say by and large as a whole, the race cars are a little bit easier to restore. You know, like if you're restoring a 65 Mustang, there's so many parts and restores and things available. That's pretty easy to do. It's just time and money. But when you start getting into cars that are far more exotic then you can't get parts and you, you can't really get away with creating parts, you know, like getting, you know, getting a, a control arm bushings for your for a Lamborghini 400 GT. You don't really make them. You got to get them and you got to wait until something comes available in Italy. And you got to wait six months, 12 months, right. whatever, you know, where a lot of the race cars, uh, so much of that stuff is fabricated that you can go in and recreate that stuff and not really devalue the car. Right. You know, yeah. Like, if you're replacing the rod ends or the heim joints of something, that's fine. Right. You know? I agree. All right. Uh, Joey Han, Le Mans, is racing Le Mans. Coming up now. What? what yeah, is... I think he's calling in right now. We're, we're uh, screening it real quick. He's... Uh, Making sure it's him. What's the date? So he's he's either <laughs> out there or going out there, right? Yeah, it's coming up uh, June 17th, 18th. Right. Today is the... Less than that? <laughs> <laughs> today's the ninth. Today, okay, today's the ninth. So like, in a week. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been there. 
Is he online too? Joey? Yep. Hey, thanks for calling in. Hello. Yeah, man. Joey Han is uh, on the phone. That's uh, Matt DeAndre over there. I'm Adam Carolla, just so uh, we're all caught up. Uh, we yeah. got the 24 hours of Le Mans coming up. F- driving the Ford GT, this is very exciting. Yeah, man, this is very exciting. You know, we uh, this project started, well, a few years ago almost now, and, um, you know, we were able to, to have some big, big stuff happen last year. You know, we won Le Mans on our first try, and not only that, but... Uh, Ford's 50th anniversary of winning in 66 to the day, mind you. And, uh, yeah, then we start out this year uh, winning Daytona and running second at Sebring. So it's been a, it's been a good little roll we've been on since, uh, since last year. So, you yeah, know, we're trying to do this again, uh, you know, in, in the 60s, Ford won 66, 67, 68, 69. So we're, uh, we wouldn't mind doing the 50th anniversary of the 67 win also, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so, pretty I mean, sure Ford and Ganassi and everybody else in involved that. agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. were we were at the Goodwood Hill Climb a few days after Le Mans, hanging around, and uh, they brought one of the cars over. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I think Marino was there. Yeah, yeah. My buddy Dirk Mueller, my teammate, he was yeah, up he there was, too. I think. Yeah, he was there. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was kind of fun. I mean, the car, like the the the, the mud on the on the on the front spoiler was like still wet. Still there. You know? Yeah. Like it was. They just brought it right on over. Yeah. Uh, is it exactly. so? How does the? It, it's three drivers, right? Yep. And yep. how many cars are you fielding the team total? We're we're fielding four cars again. Same thing we did last year. We have the two IMSA cars uh, that we run over here all year, and then the two uh, WC, the World World Endurance Championship cars that uh, are based out of England. So, yeah, all in the same banner: Ford, Chip Ganassi Racing. Um, but yeah, four of them. Uh, they're pretty pretty stellar lineup. I mean, same thing we had last year. You know, I mean, it's when you put that many bullets in the gun, if you will, um, you got a pretty good chance. A lot of a lot of good guys driving great team you know it's uh we got a good shot at but yeah we have three guys i don't know if you guys know but well you, you know that bordet sebastian bordet was one of our was our teammate last year at lamar he's you know he's born in lamar and like the tete rouge corner he says uh <laughs> but he got hurt in the indy qualifying so yeah, yeah. we're gonna have it be we're gonna miss him because he was with us for lamar you know all the long races he did with us um up until now uh, so we won Daytona and Lamar together with him, and uh, so now we're gonna have Tony Kanon with us this week, uh, which you know he's not too bad either. So, uh, no, I like cool. Tony. Tony's oh, yeah. been here with us in the studio, and yeah. we were talking a little bit about racing. He's a great yeah, guy. He's, he's a good dude. Uh, just overall, just all around good guy, and yeah, and yeah, he's a, he's a good wheel man. He was in the car in in one of the sister cars at Daytona this year, so he's got seven and a half hours in the car of drive time at Daytona, and then. He does have to learn Le Mans. He's never been there, so he's on the simulator next week doing some stuff, and this week trying to learn. But um, so that, that's that's a little different for us. But you know, we we're still comfortable with that. He's a Chip Ganassi teammate, so I think we'll be fine. But I, yeah, three guys. We'll do about three and a half hours per driver. Is it um, is it two different classes? Is it two cars in one class and two cars, in, or is it? No, nope, no, we're all in the same class. We're all in the we're same all class, fighting each other. Yeah, yeah. In the the yeah the GTE class. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember Tony. I think was explaining to us that he, when he was a, a lad, he was asked to go to Senna's place and do a go kart race. Yeah, and yeah. he, uh, I said, uh, well, and he he said with a certain obviously amount of pride that he he beat Senna yeah. on Senna's go kart track. And I said, well, but you understand, like you were twelve or thirteen, he probably you probably weighed thirty pounds less than Senna, maybe mm-hmm. forty pounds, and that's huge with a go kart. So I mean, it's it's cool, but he had he had a huge weight disadvantage. And he said, no, Senna added weight to all the carts. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow. No, is that kind totally of competitive? Yeah, so he yeah. was. I think he was asked not to come back, too, by the way. When he won, yeah. Senna was like, yeah, good good job, kid. Don't come back. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great story to have in your pocket. I'll say that. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> what could be better? Yeah. So yeah. when you guys get out there, I'm sure Tony's going to make you ride bikes around or something. That dude's a sick, like, mountain biker or or road yeah, biker he's, so, he he's probably so he's fit, probably man. done laps around the ball already on his bike <laughs> probably yeah i don't know what he's gonna do he'll probably bring a bike and ride around but uh yeah no it'll be it'll be good to have him we got a little we'll have a little um fitting him in the car uh will be a little different you know we he's he's got some some short little legs so yeah. compared to my uh my long legs extra long legs so we gotta get him fit in we haven't even 
he, when this all went down, our cars were already being shipped, well, flown. Right. Uh, they were being loaded on the on the airplane to come o- to go over to Lamar uh, to get set up and all that. So he's he's been in the car, obviously, you know, in a different car and one of the sister cars. But he hasn't been in Dirk and I's uh, car with us. So we'll probably just need to make an, a little foam insert for him or something, and um, that he can throw in behind him and then buckle in. But you know, it's it's crazy. You can fit so many different sized guys uh, pretty easily in, in, into the car and just you know do a little loose in the belt, and then somebody else tightens it and. We'll be good to go. When do you go out there? How, how far in advance do you go out? You said the team is already heading out there. Man, I've already been there and been home. I'm in California. I, I was there uh, for three days. I went over and we did our test day on Sunday, and then I shot back uh, and got home on Monday, back to California, and uh, then I go back on Friday. So I go, I go back over in a couple of days. Uh, but I like to come home. You know, my, my kids are out of school. I like to see my wife and I'll head back over, and this weekend coming up, so I get over there on Saturday, and then on uh, Sunday, Monday, they have scrutineering in the downtown of Le Mans. It's a small mm-hmm. little town. They roll the cars through. There's a stage. You sign autographs. You know, do all the, the tech stuff, scrutineering stuff, and then um, we get on track on Wednesday, and Thursday we qualify, and then Friday they have a huge parade through downtown Le Mans. It's like 150,000 people. It's unbelievable and a uh, really, really cool part of the weekend, and then we, uh, we go race on Saturday. About three thirty. Is wow. uh, it's weird because it's it's four four to four, but the time I went, they went three to three, and I, I never figured uh, out oh, why. Yeah, I don't know why they changed. They do it at Daytona all the time. Also, they change the start time. I can never figure out what what time it actually is. I thought. You could be right. It could be four. I thought it was three thirty to three thirty. Well, maybe they met. Maybe <laughs> they met in the middle. But it always it, it was always four to four, yeah. and then the year I went. Oh, I was yeah. already late, but I now it's yeah. more than an hour late because they yeah. changed it. It was crazy. Yeah. Well, if I'm going to make sure when I get there so that I'm not an hour late, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. it'd be what? a real drama if I'm starting the car. Do you have? Are you starting? That was my question. Are you starting in the car? What's what's your schedule? Your actual driving schedule? Uh, we don't know yet. We just kind of wing it when we get there. You know, we're comfortable with our driver lineup. Dirk and I. It just kind of depends um, who's feeling it. Last year, Dirk started. Um, but and it was in the rain, so I wasn't I wasn't uh, too upset with that. He hit the three started in total downpour, so uh, he uh, he he got it going. But yeah, you know, I wouldn't mind starting it uh, this year if they want. But you know, it really doesn't matter. We it cycles through. You just run laps as hard as you can and yeah. uh, hope you're there at the end. And then that last couple hours, if you got to go dogfight, that's when you do it. But you know, the start of the race and, and throughout is just keeping your car clean as possible. Um, not literally, but keeping the wheels underneath it and, the, and the, all the dive planes and the aero stuff on it and, and just making sure you've got a car to go race at the end if you have to. I mean, in a perfect world, we, go, we, uh, we run away off into the sunset, but, you know, with the competition that, at the level it is, even with just, you know, thinking of our sister cars, the chances of that are, are slim nowadays. So, mm-hmm. But I will tell you, I mean, you guys, I mean, you guys you know a lot about the history of, of racing. You know that... You know, in the 60s and 70s and even the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, I mean, we were still saving cars um, throughout a 24-hour race, uh, especially in the 60s. They would run, you know, they'd get it going and they'd find a pace and they'd just save the brakes and save the gearbox and really just try and get the car home, you know. And uh, nowadays it's totally different. We, we race, you know, we're running these things 95 98% all the time, as hard as we can push. Uh, and if the car doesn't make it, the car doesn't make it. They figure out how to fix it uh, for the next time. So, you know, it's a, it's a different different type of race. It's, it's really like a 24-hour sprint race nowadays. Um, so the level is really high. I mean, the way the safety cars work, you don't get bunched up anymore. So if a safety car comes out, you're, you're held, you're locked in your position. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to lose any time. A minute lost in the pits is a minute you have to gain in, in actual lap time. So... It's a, it's very different, but you got to be on your toes. You got to really be be hustling the whole time, and you know that that becomes especially difficult in the night. If it gets if it gets rain in the night, man, your eyes will be bugging out of your head because uh, let me tell you, there's no there's no extra light on the Mulsanne straight other than your headlights at 190. Yeah, the, unless somebody's uh, in front of you. How how <laughs> yeah. long do you? No one's gonna be in front of them. Well, lap traffic. <laughs> how? Yeah, thank you. You say you're in the car for three and a half hours, but you're you're yeah. refueling sooner than that right yeah so we're yeah i mean it's you know three and a half hours is about as mo- as the most you'll go but we we try and do it at three hours so that would be three stints about you can just figure 
an hour for a fuel stint. So uh, you're trying to double stint or triple stint tires if you can. But uh, for sure we'll run three hours because it makes for the best rest time. Since Le Mans, it's a maximum of three drivers, you know. Daytona, right. you can use four or five, which mm-hmm. then you could have a lot of time to rest. But Le Mans is only three. So if you only do two hours per driver, well, that's only a four-hour break for, for you. And by the time you get back, get some food, maybe take a shower, change into a fresh set of uh, driver stuff, man, you're already back on deck. So you need that, you need that gap so a guy can just get refreshed you know, get uh, get some food in you and do all that. So that's that seems to be the best way to do, do it. So f- you do about three, three-hour stints. Do you have to ish. force yourself into that pattern? Because it seems like there's so much adrenaline stuff going on. There's no there's no real sleep. Like, so when you get out, you, yeah. do you have to say to yourself, hey, I've got to I've gotta hydrate, I've got to get some food, because if I don't do it now... For I'm gonna, sure, I'm on gonna, that front. Yeah, yeah. That, I'm always hungry. I live my life hungry, so it's not a problem for me. <laughs> but... Uh, I, it's it's more the sleep thing, you know. I, I did it on an hour and a half sleep last year, um, and you know you just gotta. It's tough to do, but it's it's best if you can get you know get kind of booked up on some sleep going into the week, going into the race in the day. So, uh, but yeah, it's difficult. I mean, it's just one of those things where you just you're just basically pulling an all nighter. But you know, it's not even just twenty four hours because remember the day the race starts at well, let's just say three thirty. Starts at three um, this year, by the way. <laughs> between three and four. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the morning, you get up at, you know, 8 o'clock, if not earlier, to start the day and events and PR things. And so it ends up being, especially for the crew guys, I mean, forget about us, the crew guys are out there getting the car ready. So it turns into about a 50-hour day um, for those guys. I would imagine that somebody is addressing this issue we're talking about because, you know, there's lots of studies that say sleep deprivation is as bad as be- as drunk driving. Yeah. Like when you're when you're tired, you're not functioning as well as you could. You may be at, you know, you're talking about the cars are running 95 plus percent. But when you're really sleep deprived, you're running at 65 percent, like maybe. And I would assume that, you know, part of the technology that's in the cars has also got to go toward the drivers. Like I, there should be a chamber that you guys go to that just, they just pump in Enya and like (laughs) ether or something. And you pass out for five hours because you on, on get, get, getting four hours sleep versus getting 45 minutes sleep in the middle of the night. That's, that's a different skill. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think, you know, what, what I learned from all these 24 hour races I've done is, is to try and pack on that sleep in the days ahead and you can do it. You front if you load do, it. If you do, yeah, if you, if you can front load some sleep, but if you do, you know, four or five hours each night and then try and do that all night, it's tough. It's, it's not going right. to work. So I think, I think it's manageable. You know, you don't feel, especially with the adrenaline, like you'll feel like, oh, boy, that's, that's not going to be a lot of sleep. But when you get in the car, it's crazy how you're, you're awake and you're on it. I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, yeah, could you be better if you had eight hours in between stints? Probably, yeah. But well, uh, I think that's what separates, you know, there's just a, there's a handful of guys who just, you know, just always end up being good at 24-hour races, you know, just figuring out how to do it. And once you get a system for it, um, it actually, you know, you don't feel too bad during the period of time. When you get done with the race, especially at Le Mans, because Le Mans is a, it's just a, it just keeps you on your toe. It's a very fast track. A lot of fast corners. It's super dark in the night. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of action with cars passing you, you passing cars. It always so rains. It always rains. It always it rains. It always rains. It yeah. always rains. Is, I hope it, not this year, but the, the, it always rains. The year I went, they literally just sort of yellow flagged like the last 10 laps. It was like raining just so hard rain. that they yeah. just went like, all right, well, we're going to keep running, but at half speed yeah. until we get to three yeah. o'clock. That's how they started last year. They started under a safety car because it was raining so hard they couldn't take the green, so they just rolled cars around under a safety car for about almost an hour, I think. It's kind of a bummer way to rain. start. It's such an epic race. <laughs> yeah. It was a little bit of a yeah. You know, it, it seems bit... it seems so physically demanding to to do that type of race, but you're in the car for so long. At at some point during the car, does it feel like like you're getting a little too comfortable? And then you got to sort of wake yourself up, you know, just like an alertness, Ooh. a focus, you I've, know? I've never been there, especially at Le Mans. There's not a lot of, <laughs> you don't get too comfortable there. I mean, so you have a good you're, race car. So just, your adrenaline is pumping. You're just on. Yeah. You're, like mentally, you're at full throttle the whole time. And yeah. that's just got to be physically taxing. 
like to it do is, that for is, three hours. Yeah, and you recognize it. Like I said, you don't recognize it till the end. A lot of times at the end of the race, especially at Le Mans, you just like, wow, that's uh, hmm. you just like really coming down. You're like, whew, I'm I'm tired now, you know. Uh, and the day after, it, it can be taxing, you know. But uh, during during it, it's never never crossed my mind, you know. But again, you know, we're talking about this is what we do, you know. Especially me, I've been doing it for a long time, and and you know, all these guys have been doing it for a long time, so. You just get you get used to it, you know. There's something knocks you out of your zone, if you will, your you know subconscious. Um, most people call it the zone. Then you have ways of finding your way back in. You know, it could be could be man, something happened. You get flashed by headlights. You have a close call with a prototype or something, and you're like, whoa, that was close. But you can get back into that zone and get going pretty good. So that's the trick. I mean, but you know, you got to have you got to have your your routines. You know, whether it's what you eat, how much you eat. Um, what you do in between, uh, you know, a lot of us, I get, we have a massage therapist, like a physio there. So I'll go in between runs and get, uh, have her just stretch you out because, you know, if you do, if you drive three hours up and down interstate five here in California or any freeway, right? You just pick, just do three hours. You're going to be stiff. And that's kind of what you get in the car. You just kind of get like locked in. You can't move. You can't like turn on one cheek and then turn on the other cheek. You know? right. So you're just kind of stuck in there and, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff when you get out of the car, you're like, just kind of stretch it out. And, well, and, that's uh, why we that turned the thing. massage around. We got the massage seats and seat <laughs> in the Lincoln we drove, so we didn't really didn't have but that issue. Still that's felt, not, felt that's my calf idea. cramping up yeah. a little bit. Cause it, yeah. Yeah. But, I'm going to uh, put that in my next race report. Please. Yeah, just saying, that car had like 30-way adjustable seats, so they are available <laughs> from Ford. So yeah. uh, last <laughs> question for you, Johan. Um, who is the I, – I know, I guess the competition is uh, from within, but – other than the GTs, uh, the four GTs, who's yep. is is Ferrari? Is Porsche like Corvette? Who, Corvette? Like think, who's who's well, up think, there? I think this year you're going to see that probably the, the most competitive, if you ask me, of all of having all the class, all the manufacturers together. I think it's going to be really, really close. I think um, uh, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be you know Corvette and Porsche were quick at the test on Sunday, um, but Ferrari, you know, was was the one we were fighting last year and they have three cars there last this year again so i think it's going to be a real dogfight i I don't know i can put my finger on who's like our biggest competition other than our cars but i can tell you that corvette's always strong in the long run no matter what their pace is they're always strong at 24-hour events yeah um porsche is i think got one of the quickest cars right now um, it, it, not sure if they're going to show everything, but they definitely, I think, have one of the quickest cars, but it's also the newest car of the fleet, so can they do the distance? Uh, but they're known to be great in 24 hours also. Uh, and the Ferrari is just always there. They're always quick. Um, they just probably have, I would say the Ferrari has the most problems normally uh, of anybody. So you, you just never know. I think us, we feel a lot better ourselves going into this year because we feel a lot more sorted out. Sure. You know, last year, man, we were... We were coming in there just, just getting bodywork pieces, and the boys were just figuring out, you know, certain things and how to work on stuff. And you know, we've come so far since that race last year to now. Yeah, um, there is no as far as that. Yeah, goes. there's no. I mean, as much as you think you can do with a computer and a and a simulator or a dyno or yeah. whatever, it's just you've yeah. got to get out and, and sort and, the car and out. And I think yeah. those GTs are badass looking cars on the track. We we saw them yeah. in, in uh, Long Beach as well, doing some laps there and at the uh, at Goodwood at the hill climb and. They're just cool looking cars, oh, man. man. Aren't they? It's gotta I mean, be when exciting. It came out, I was sure. like, I hope it's as badass as it looks, you know. And, it, <laughs> and it's proven to be. I mean, there's people are going to start seeing the, the street cars out there too now, and those things are really yeah, cool. yeah. Oh, no, no, Le- Leno, Leno, Leno just got his. Leno just got his. Yeah. Oh yeah, he did. Yeah. Oh, and Jack yeah. Roush just got his. Oh. Yeah, I know Chip. Chip got his. Um, so there's uh, those things gonna be rolling around. I tell you, those are gonna be head turners. You roll up. I mean. On top of there's only two fifty a year being built. Yeah. So when you roll up with one of those, it's going to be. I, I don't think there's going to be a, a parking lot full of them. When are you getting yours? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure yet. We'll maybe see. maybe <laughs> after next weekend. Well, you should ask uh, that question again, right? Yeah. See, yeah. See well, how you do. I'm, I'm still. I'm. I'm still. Uh, it's on the table. It's on the table. I'll put it that way. But <laughs> um, yeah, we're still trying to figure that all out. But. You know, it's uh, it's it is a very cool car. I got I was lucky to drive a few weeks ago at Salt Lake City. I got to drive it real hard at uh, at the track there and the the worldwide media launch, and it was it is a very fun car to drive. So the street car you drove, yeah, yeah that's cool. Yeah, street car, yeah, street car is really it's it's a fun car, man. It they did a really good job. 
the the power output's about the same, right? From the race car to the street oh, car? More, more than the race car. Well, I was yeah, thinking, more, yeah, so I was thinking about because the race car has limitations. Yeah. Or, yeah, class limitations. we have this balanced performance, so they're always, they can they can take boost away and give it and stuff like that. Weight, no more, uh, more weight, less weight on the car. But yeah, so uh, the, the street car is 647 horsepower. That's, from what I know of ours, that's over 100 horsepower more than we have in the race car. Yeah. So when I was driving the streetcar a couple <laughs> weeks ago, I was like, man, it puts you in your seat. Like, burr, burr, you're just accelerating every pull of gear. So I, 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 wrote, uh, I wrote in my guys, like, hey, uh, this power is a lot better. I like it. <laughs> but, the you know, tires yeah. are also, the seat's you, a little no, more comfortable, and the yeah, air works. Yeah, no, nothing air you can works. do about it. It's just <laughs> part of the racing. You know, that's what makes that's what makes this GT class in the race series uh, so cool. Is that you know they've they, they're trying to balance it so that it makes a good show for the for the fans, and that's you know that's the way it is. Joey Hand Racing is where you can go. That's the website. Uh, the race yeah. three p.m. Uh, yeah, June seventeenth uh, and eighteenth. Uh, we'll we'll be watching. You guys need to watch this uh, Ford Performance. This is Ford Performance TV dot TV, oh. and it's live stream of all of our cars on boards. It's oh, really cool. Oh, that's so awesome. That's how my family watches here. They'll just watch the on board. Especially my son, he loves watching. You can watch every lap, the whole race, twenty four hours. That'll be awesome. The car. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, shut it off when you Twitter. get the massage, though. I don't yeah, know if yeah. your wife wants to watch you. <laughs> yeah. I'll, just, I'll take my GoPro off my hat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joey Han. Yeah, right, good guys. luck. Good luck, man. Pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks. See Thank you. you. All right. Joey Han, everybody. Yeah, we'll be watching that. Sounds like a lot of work. It's It, it sounds like, cool. Now, you know, the for thing. For the whole team, that's a lot of work. The thing that, oh, my God. The thing that always strikes me is the Ford looks like a prototype. Mm-hmm. Whereas the 911 looks, looks like, like a 911, the yeah. vet really looks like a vet. Like, yeah, it, it seems to have an advantage because you just you look at that Ford and you go, well, that's in the prototype class, and then you look at the vet and you go, is that stock or yeah, but, uh... <laughs> yeah, and the 911 looks like a 911, and the Ferrari what 488 or whatever, it is, or it's a new one, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. I think it's it, 488. It, it looks like it, it looks. Yeah, it's you know not I mean? that much. Right, it looks yeah. kind of like a street car. Yeah, but and then, I, then it, this thing pulls up. It's funny because the the Ford GT we've seen it in race trim before, really even seeing it in street trim. So now when you see the street car, you're like, oh, that looks like the race car. Right, you know, instead of the other way around. Right, it's always <laughs> the other way around. All right, uh, let's see. Evan's been on hold for a while. Evan, twenty nine, Columbus, Ohio. Hey man, it's great to talk to you again. Good to talk uh, to you again, Evan. Yeah, um, I was one of the top contributors for Road Hard, and uh, after the show at Amalfi, you uh, finished your beer, told everybody good night. You walked over, and you uh, you hugged me. <laughs> that's, one the, that's one of the that's one of the best memories of my life. Wow, nice, thanks. Yeah, I'll never Lucky. forget that man. <laughs> <laughs> never hugs me. Chris is still waiting on his hug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, I got to man. Talk to Mike August. Mike August is a great guy. He is. Unless, yeah, unless well, you're uh, getting an angry, confused email from him. But, it's uh, four words long. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, what's going on in your life, Evan? Well, um, I just moved out and about two months ago, and the day after I moved out, my father bought my favorite car. He mm. bought a 2016 Plum Crazy Purple Dodge Challenger. Mm, nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah cool. I mm-hmm. love that car. And he tells me when uh, when he dies, I can have it. <laughs> well, let's hope it's not behind the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <geez. laughs> yeah. The car caught on uh, fire. Anyway, yeah. when we're done removing your dad from it. <laughs> and you can have what's Jesus. left. <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, where should we send the flatbed? Yeah. Uh, All right. So, uh, right. Uh, my question was, is this the type of car that tends to go down in value or up in value or stay the same? I think it will go down initially, and then it'll come back up again. Like like what happens to all cars? Or I, or yeah. in, unless and you know, I like the plum crazy purple. I, it depends. I don't know if he got options. You know, obviously optioned up is a good thing. You know, I don't know if the cars. Uh, There's manual probably not a lot in that sh- color shift. So that's kind of cool. Uh, seem to yeah, see, I, I, I see got, more orange I, ones than I see in black. And, and black. And, yeah, it's, black. black's not a good color. Purple's good. So, I'm yeah. going to have to learn how to drive a stick. That's all right. 
Oh, it's good. I'm glad that it's a stick. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think if most of them are stick or most of them are automatic. It, the, the, the point is this. Um, you look after the car. Uh, hopefully, Dad's around for a good long time. Dad will, yeah, I hope so. Dad will own the car when it's on the way down. And then by the time he uh, dies uh, peacefully in the in the in the arms of his third wife, uh, he will then give the car to you when it's on its, on way, its way up. up. Yeah. yeah. And by then you'll know how to drive stick. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm working on it, and uh, I'm just not very good with. It. I drive a Ford truck. I'm, we live out in the country. Well, I used to live out in the country, so I had a truck, and it's just a. Uh, automatic so i never had the opportunity and there's no way in hell he's gonna let me drive this thing to learn well you know you can uh as 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 i famously told everyone i i taught a a model to drive on a stick on a viper you know yeah you can do it it's just push that clutch in when you run into trouble that's all Uh, that's That's all thanks evan hey hey before you let me go can i ask one favor yeah can i put my twitter Hmm, what? Can I put my Twitter out? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm at real Evan Archer. There's like 30 Evan Archers, but I'm the only real one I've, I've decided. Okay. And uh, it's mostly comedy-based. But uh, thank you so much for talking to me. Uh, I can't wait to see what movies you come out with next, man. Oh, thanks, Evan. I appreciate it. Well, we got, uh, obviously, 24-Hour Wars out, the Newman Doc's out, Willie T. Ribs is... Coming soon? Coming soon. It's getting getting pretty close. Uh, I saw about a fifty minute version of it uh, the other night. It's yeah. looking looking good. Am sorry, Amsoil. Hmm. Move beyond stock performance. Amsoil synthetic motor oil combines top tier synthetic technology with unique additives to protect up to twenty five thousand miles or one year in between oil changes. Uh, shields engines from wear and deposits, wear on pistons and cams, and that leads to uh, loss of power, everybody. You don't want that loss of power, do you? No, no. We love Amsoil over here. We love lubrication, but especially the best. 75% more engine protection against uh, horsepower loss and wear than required by the industry standard. Piston cleanli- cleanliness, next to godliness, Ninety-three percent above the industry standard, tested in the field and on the track in extreme conditions. So, what should you do? Go to Amsoil A M S O I L Amsoil dot com slash carcass. Get more information. Amsoil devoted to protection. Yeah. All right, uh, last call here. Alex, thirty-two, Washington D.C. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Uh, quick, uh, quick tire pressure question. Um, it's getting hotter out here in DC, and I, I, I'm pretty diligent about keeping my tires right at like 34, as uh, as the owner's manual states. But it, it's gone up like eight pounds. Like I checked the the monitor on my dashboard, like 45, you know, 44 pounds. Is that heat related? And it, I can bleed, you know, I bleed air out of them, but it goes back up. Uh, every time, what can I do to kind of manage the correct uh, tire pressure throughout the summer? Why don't you, because you're you and you seem like you're into it, why don't you go for some nitrogen? Yeah, you could do that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've heard that. that. That's that's not a gimmick like rust-proofing thing, right? It has a purpose, correct? It does. I mean, first off, if, if all race cars do it, serious race cars do yeah. it, then it's not a gimmick. It allows you to keep pressure pretty consistent uh, as the tire temperatures change drastically. Right. So uh, you're the kind of guy, you know, if I was talking to my wife, I don't think I would bring this up, but, uh, but for she you, might. she'd probably bring it up. She'd probably bring it up. But <laughs> hey, but I wanted to talk to you about nitrogen. I, I don't have time. I'm, I'm watching my, sh- I'm watching my <laughs> stories, <laughs> but uh I think you should go for some nitrogen. And I don't know a ton about it, but I th- imagine you could just go online, find some tire performance tire place or whatever that had that service. And for some sort of nominal one time, whatever, yeah, you'd just go get your nitrogen. Yeah, it's probably not that expensive to do. It's probably super cheap to do. And uh, I mean, I don't I don't know how available it is in your area, but uh, but we do have it around here. I, I know guys who go out and do it. 
Yeah. And all the GTRs, the right. Nissan oh. GTRs, I believe, came that way. Yeah. So uh, let's go nitrogen. That definitely sounds good. I'll seek that out. Hey, what one quick question, Ace? What do you think about this one? You honk at the person in front of you for not moving or whatever reason, and they try and honk back in reverse. Never works, right? It's silly. <laughs> it, it, there is a yeah. There's the reverse honk. I like now. Obviously, it doesn't work at all if someone's in front of them. Yeah, but uh, the back at you honk is a weird. It's a weird thing. It's it's a weird. It it's it's kind of like a boomer honk. Yeah, it's like a boomerang. <laughs> yeah. It just comes back to you, but it it doesn't really work because it's sort of like they're just honking into the heavens. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I I yeah. agree. Exactly, we're all doomed. Thanks, boys. We're all doomed. That's right. But at least uh, next time you honk, you have some nitrogen in your car tires. I love the horn, by the way. I honk at everything, mostly because it just confuses people. Because I'm not really honking for any real reason. <laughs> My biggest move so that weird. people hate is I, if I'm driving, if I'm sitting in a passenger seat yeah. and the guy in front of us isn't moving and you're not honking, I reach over and oh, honk all the time. for you, yeah, all which the time. is my move. <laughs> Do it. And then you yell. Yeah. Uh, which the guy can't hear. They're holding us up, man. God can hear it. <laughs> you know what else God wants you to do? He wants you to uh, go online, see if you can save some money on your auto insurance at geico.com. 15 minutes. Could save you 15% or more on your car insurance. Look, everyone's got stuff to do. Why not just add this to your to-do list? Saving money on your auto insurance over at Geico. So you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to take off your bathrobe or slippers. Just fire up the computer. Go to geico.com. Spend a few minutes and find out just how much they could be saving you on your auto insurance. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's see. Um, you can, uh, go to, uh, check out, uh, no safe spaces, me and Dennis Prager's new material up there all the time, contribute and, uh, be a part of this fabulous project. Also, we're doing a reasonable doubt town hall coming up, uh, July 20th. You get tickets at com. shift and steer. That's Matt's podcast. Check that out. And, uh, you can go to uh shift and steer.com. You can get yeah. your podcast. We're going to be at the, uh, uh, SoCal speed shop, uh, open house event lots of good stuff lots of material coming your way just go to adamcroll.com uh there, we're doing a live podcast uh this thursday irvine improv jump on that always uh, sells out levity live and oxnard coming up july 6 caesar's palace cleopatra's barge man that's uh thursday july 13th so come on out we're having we have fun in vegas and uh corolla drinks and all that kind of stuff chassis C-H-A-S-S-Y. Go there and check out. Lots of material up there. I think we're getting some shirts and mugs and stuff like that. So, till next time. Adam Carolla for Matt, the moderator, DeAndrea saying, keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wind. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla Digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit carcastshow.com.